You'll have a restful transition into 2023, I hope. Yeah. A lot of visitors. Oh, yeah. Good. You know, people you wanted to see or you were just the yeah. convenient. <laughs> yeah, just uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of people at one time. Yeah. But it was nice. Well, I have been in the twilight zone and I have to ask this question if anybody else has had this experience. You know how when you're going to set a stone in a bezel, uh, this I made a piece of jewelry and to me it was snake bit. But anyway, you know, you get a set a piece of a stone at a, at a bezel and you put the dental floss down. Yep. Well, I dropped my bag and son of a gun, if the stone didn't land right side up in the bezel, I could not get that stone <laughs> out. We tried every little trick in the book um, from beeswax to shaking it in real hard in a plastic container to my husband was a metal smith. He said, freeze it. I tried freezing it. That didn't work. He tried getting it out. I finally said, the hell with it. I could remelt the silver. So I destroyed the bezel. Oh. That was okay. Oh. But on that same piece, here is the, here is my other, here is my twilight zone story. Big time. I use, because I'm here in Virginia right now, I was pickling and I used vinegar and salt because I was doing it in my kitchen. I have it in a soup mug on a cup warmer and I probably had it anywhere from maybe 18 inches to two feet away from my mixer. Pickle the piece, put the stuff away, get ready. Friday before Christmas to make a batch of cookies and I go to put my beater in my mixer and I got black stuff all over my hand. Now when I say the mug, the mug has a plastic lid but I don't fasten it down just to give yeah. it a little air. So I said, what, what is this on my hand? So I yelled, this at my husband, I said, did you use this mixer? He said, no, because I had used it a couple of weeks before and there was nothing wrong with it. So he came in there and he scrubbed it and he scrubbed it. He scrubbed it with steel wool. He scrubbed it with everything. And so he said, it's clean now. It's not black anymore. Well, it had originally been a silvery color. It wasn't black like it was looking now. So yeah. I picked it up out of the dish drainer and black still came off on my hand. He said, this is like some kind of chemical reaction has occurred. Well, the only yeah. thing that had happened in those two weeks was that salt vinegar. So I don't have I now have to buy a new mixer is my point. So I'm just warning anybody that's doing table, kitchen table soldering and stuff, you might want to watch your pickle solution. So and what is near. So steel's definitely susceptible and I'm assuming your mixer blade is steel and not an enamel coated one. Exactly. And it must be um you know, like pot metal type of thing. It, it, it's, it does, it's always been a little roughy, like, but not real, you know, not slick like a stainless steel blade would be, you know, oh, a stainless okay. steel blade would be. So, so I don't, I don't know. But that was, I called my friend and I said, you're not going to believe this. Well, I called her when the stone stuck and I said, how did it just magically land in the daggone bezel? I couldn't couldn't have done it better myself, and it still I still don't know why it caught and wouldn't come out. And I said, then the same piece, and now I got to buy a new mixer. So a couple of questions for you on okay. the on the blackening part to start. When your husband touched it, did it give him blackened hands as well? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Because when he scrubbed, and when he you might be having yeah. a chemical reaction right. to it. Um, right when he scrubbed so, it, when he scrubbed it, it it was yeah. it came out silvery again. But so uh, the only thing I would consider before you give up on that blade is trying a super pickle. So hydrogen peroxide. I don't. The, the problem is I don't know if hydrogen peroxide works with a vinegar salt combo. Has anybody on the call tried it? I've mm -hmm. only done it with true uh, uh, sodium bisulfate pickle. Um, well, I guess I could take, since I can't use it now, I'm, and I'm getting ready to go back to Florida Sunday, I'll just take it with me where I can yeah, do that. <laughs> try it. So, um, so you may be right that if it's, a, if it's an inexpensive pot metal, it may have just etched enough of one of the components of it. 
um, that you're not going to salvage it, sort of the way that yeah. if you sometimes get a bad casting, there's sort of inclusions in it and material that, that have, that's etched away um, or bubbled away. Um, but the, the super pickle might just be enough to take whatever that coating is. You may just not have gone far enough with the sanding that your husband did. Um, but yeah, when it comes to food stuff, if you're getting junk coming off of it, I'd, I'd rather safe than sorry, no matter what. Exactly. Um, so, yeah. I mean, it's so, old, but it's not that old, but it was expensive, but that's okay. And, and yeah. that's what Tony said. Well, you said, I said, I'm not putting, I'm not making food with that. I don't know what it yeah. is. And the question would, would also be whether the mechanism of the mixer itself and not just the blade has been decimated. You may be able to get away with just ordering a new blade. Well, the, unfortunately, the company's on his third buyout. So oh. I guess that's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, got it. So I've had things like that happen mysteriously to individual metal things in my studio or even weirder when I was in somebody else's studio. So I was taking a Charles Luton brain class and he was borrowing some of my tools and um, my, uh, my anvil came back coated with fine copper, I mean, you know, fine uh, uh, rust all over it. Oh my and God. None of the other stuff did. And it wasn't, you know, it was being dried off when it was being used. It wasn't like a patchy thing the way that I've seen when you have blotches of water. It was literally a powder coat of the whole thing. Um, and I've had individual files do that occasionally. So um, sometimes it's proximity to the pickle. Sometimes it's something else in the atmosphere. Who knows? Um, you know. And all I could think is I keep my pickle pot next to my uh, guillotine and as expensive as those guillotine things, because I've got the big one, as expensive as they are, I'm going to move that when I get back. Keep to it away. Time. Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple of things that really shouldn't be near each other in the shop. Um, obviously, your polishing gear needs to stay away from a lot of things. And your pickle is one of those ones that is a risky thing. Um, it, it, and we don't all have a lot of space for it. So sometimes that's problematic too. But back to your original source of your mystery situation, um, <laughs> instead of plain old beeswax, I highly recommend Kate Wolf's sticky wax um, because it's so much more solid and you put it on a little toothpick, right? Yeah. And flatten it down and pop it up. That's one option. If you don't have a pry bar, this is for pulling up um uh edges of bezels it's specifically meant for prong and bezel pull-ups and this thing if, if if you're careful with it you won't mar your bezel and so what you do is you tuck it in to the edge of the the bezel and you just open things out a little bit right and yeah. you work your way around the outside edge and just having it open enough at the top may let you push it out and then before i go to destruction my last ditch is a very careful drill hole from underneath. So what, you have a small hole. If you want, you can go yeah. ahead and pierce something instead, but that way right. you can then put uh, a toothpick or something like that and push up from underneath. Because if, yeah. it if it fell in, it's got to be able to come back out. That's, well, that's, see, that's what it makes sense. Yeah, they say if you swallow something, you can get it back out. Yeah, so the, that was, <laughs> I kept thinking that the whole time. Hey, it fell in. It, accidentally falls in and I can't get to that little thing out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, well, that's an adventure from one little attempt to get a, a bezel, a stone out of a bezel. That's a bummer. Um, but hopefully you'll you'll use it as an excuse to get the next generation of mixer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> so gang, welcome back. Uh, happy New Year. Happy one year anniversary of this project. Um, I'm going to do a little of the usual runaround just so we have it at the beginning of the video. As always, you all know and could probably say it with me. I'm not John Cogswell. I will never be John Cogswell. I'm only trying to share my uh, journey through his brain as he's presented it down on the page for us. Um, and uh, all errors are due to the uh, artist at hand, not to the author. <laughs> um. So as per usual, I'm going to post up the various links in the chat group in case anybody needs them. And I'm also going to give you one new uh, code this time because I finally got my uh, so far scheduled classes posted. And you guys as devoted diehards of the Cogswell Project are getting a code you can use on my uh, website 
through the month of January that will get you 15% off any of those classes. So if you register early, you get a bonus. So that Zoomers23 is the code um, for registering. And you are welcome to share that with friends who might want to register for classes, although I'm only giving it out to the Cogswell crew. So I'll know that the people that uh, registered somehow got connected either via being actual participants or friends of participants. Um, and that you'll just have to fill it in as you go to the shop when you register for my various classes. The one thing I don't have on there is that new connections class that I'm working on, which I know several of you have asked me to try and uh, plan one out. Um, I'm looking ahead at my year and trying to figure out where I can can fit it in without killing myself. I, I had a, a casual poll from you guys whether you would be interested in a December class um, either the week between Christmas and New Year's next year, or um, uh, if you would want it the first week of December or second week of December before we get into the Christmas cycle. I'm sort of feeling like I'd be better off holding until January 2024. Yeah, I'm seeing a yes from at least one person. No, you want it sooner, so <laughs> not January. No. No, that's, that's, that's too far from now. Too far away to plan. Yeah, unfortunately, I have to sort of juggle it with my actual uh, everyday day job and not my my one that I enjoy doing day job. No, I, I know, um, I know people. I know people who friends who plan two years in advance, three yeah. years. I can't. <laughs> mm. There's a chance that I will find that Metalworks wants to host something like that, and I'll run it through them in one mm -hmm. of the slots that I've posted for if they have availability for me uh, but it's it's likely that I won't be able to have both time to prep for the class because it's a whole new curriculum uh, and I need to get all the all the demo pieces and everything done um, and have it any sooner um I yeah just no I, I'm joking don't listen yeah. to me because I, but, I I live I live a wild life <laughs> okay but December, it sounds like is not necessarily a good opportunity like I shouldn't try to cram it in December I should just hold for January, it sounds like, for people. Okay. When I think so. about this year, yeah, like how busy I was and, you know, just getting together with people and stuff. Um, right. Yeah. It's I'm with it, you on that one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, that the the only thing that that code is not good for is the one in-person class. If, if, if I'm hosting, if I'm not hosting a class, I can't give discounts on it. And so the wax working class that I'm teaching in Portland um, is in person and it's through the local metals guild here, which is a fun one, um, really enthusiastic bunch of people and they get some good programming. Um, and so the, the code that you have there is only good for my, uh, my three online workshops thus far. Uh, if I can figure out a scheduling thing, I will put that in in time for the January um, cutoff for the for the discount. But uh, again, not likely with what I'm seeing in my calendar. I, the problem is uh, trying to juggle the shows. I would love to do a midsummer workshop, but um, I don't know what shows I'm getting into yet, and that's the heavy season for me. So. Um, as always, we have the Rio Grande code. If you need it, just remember that that expires every six months. You can reset it. So if you are not seeing wholesale pricing when you go to Rio, you're going to want to use that Rio code. And what else? Um, I think that's it because you guys are all returning customers. Um, so today we're going to finish the cut card setting. And we're going to talk about some tools that I was doing a little bit of organizing in my shop over the holiday weekends. Um, and so I found some tools that I kind of went, oh, why did I forget that I had that to help me with things? So I want to show from our crown setting. Um, this tool comes from AutoFry and it is from Metal Arts. So I suspect you can get it elsewhere. Um, and it is a 17 degree cone. I don't know if you remember, but when we were talking crown settings, I said there are two most common um, degree settings and it's a funky little tool. It's not, it's a little kludgy. It's a little awkward to use. What you do is you put your stone in from the back, um, table side down, and then you tape it in place as tucked down as it goes. And you, then you have to be careful if you're, 
what sticks out of the bottom like mine does with this stone. But what you're what you're doing then is using the array of things that they have here to mark out where the top of your stone is, if I can figure out where I put my pencil down. And you need a pencil for this. So mine is coming to this line. It's a it looks like it's a 10 millimeter stone, and that makes sense. And what you do is these lines, these little grooves in here are all um, in depth, like they're dug in. So you basically pencil over all of the grooves to, till they fill with pencil lead. And you know how on our, on our John approach, we were using the paper and measuring everything out and doing that roughly three and a little bit. And I was saying, he's got it a little more than I want because I keep having extra. Well, this is the exact, you know, 3.1415, whatever pi measurement against the framework that you've got. So by putting this here, when I fill it in with the, um, the pencil lead, then I take tape. They actually recommend packing tape, but I couldn't find any today. And I, so I put the tape over where I put down all of the um, graphite and I rub it in. I'm gonna even actually take the pencil nip again and just sort of run it down all the lines so that it comes in where it's supposed to. And then you can, uh, I'm gonna put an extra piece of tape down because again, if it were packing tape, it would all hold together, but I don't want it to, the strips to come apart. And then I can peel this up, peel the tape up carefully. And what I have is a pattern that hits the exact size of it. I'm going to bring my camera down a little bit so you guys can see a little more. So it does the pattern. What I found is I need to then transfer that tape onto either a piece of paper or a piece of cardboard or, you know, manila folder or something. And then I cut it out and... Um, in doing so, if you do it on a manila or something, you could make all of your standard sizes and just make little templates. Just the one that I made the other day. So this is one that is for, I think, a nine millimeter stone. And I just taped it on both sides or taped it on one side and papered it on the other. So it's got a little bit of, uh, of, um, of solidity there. I've got a template I can go use going forward and then I can mark it for whatever size it was. And so I can make myself a set of these to just carry around in my kit if I'm traveling or whatever. Um, super nice. And the, the delight for me is because it's a 17 degree, exactly, instead of using John's method where you decide what kind of angle you want while you're drawing it. In this case, I know that it's going to match my 17 degree block punch that I was using when I showed you how I helped to make my cone. If you don't have a cone, no big deal. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but the cone fits better when you already got it measured for a 17 degree. Um, and so this is a nice, I think it, I, I bought it so long ago that I'd forgotten I had it. I think it might be like a 20 or $25 tool. And again, the brand on it is Metal Arts with a Z at the end, A-R-T-Z. And it's their 17 degree cone, which kind of implies there may be another one in the world for the other size cone. Um, but boy, super easy to make your template instead of individually measuring each one. Questions about that? Okay, so that was one cool tool I reminded myself I had. And then the other cool tool, because you, you guys have watched me struggle with how I get my precision marks done when I'm doing a cone, is that I realized I have, in addition to my round kit, which I'm using, again, now it nicely fits the 17 degrees, and so this punch is just put it in the appropriate size and dome it down. There we go, that's the right size. So that's tapping it to get it nice and precise. These things are stupidly expensive if you find them at uh, a junk store or something. Anything under 75 bucks, if it's not all rusted and rotted, is worth picking up because they run 100 and up easily. Um, some of them are as much as $300 when you get to fancier shapes. Um, but what I realized I had is the one of the others I'd picked up was square. And so if I use my round block 
and then lightly tap my square into place, I've now got interior marks that give me my perfect quadrant of all four spots. I've gone beyond that because I've been cutting in, but I get my north, south, east, west marks that I can use. And then that's way healthier than my quality of measuring. I'm just not good enough at doing my measuring. And But it, what it does is it gives me a base to lay things out and then I can work the in-between measurements that I need to a little bit easier. Doesn't get me if I want a six, six prong or something, but maybe there's a hex out there that I haven't seen or you can find a tool that would do it. Um, so this is from my perspective, because I'm struggling with some of these, I've been looking for, am I using the right tools? Now that I've, now that I've tried John's hand method, what do I go to next to improve my own quality of work? Because sometimes, as in the case of, say, learning to sew on a bad machine versus learning to sew on a good machine, sometimes the right tool will help you out a great deal. Um, so I'm going to hopefully have another cleaned up, much happier and proportional version of the crown setting before we actually set those. Questions on either of those things? Yeah, I was wondering about, does, does the cone ever get stuck in there? This cone? Oh, the cone getting stuck in? Yeah, you're supposed to put a little bit of burr life on it when you toss it in there if you're going to hammer it down. Um, and if it does, you can usually push from the back side a little bit. Okay. If you're, so if you're finding it's happening frequently, there are a couple of possibilities. One is you got a cheap uh, uh, block that has edges to it, and you may just need to burnish them down a little bit around the top of the, of the hole. Or the other is that you're actually trying to put it in too small of a hole, and you should okay. start bigger. Just like when we're doing um, dapping, we start big and move down to small. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Right. Other questions? Okie doke. So let's talk about what I did between sessions on our um, ca cut card. So this weird little thing, I, I, re I was unhappy with my original marking out, so I've redone it in a little bit more legible red. And right now it looks like a little video game critter to me. But if you'll recall from last session, before we ended, what we did was we made a perfectly uh, matched, folded over set. So it's squared up. Well, this one's rectangled up. It doesn't have to be square, but they have to be matched front and back with a clean, straight, 90 degree line creasing. And in this case, unlike when we're doing cornering on boxes or cornering on bezels, remember that we cut and folded away from the cut. So we were trying to get a close fit fold over. And all that that leftover bit of metal at the top is doing is holding things cleanly in place. If you have a lot of trouble with that, you could also use some epoxy to put your pieces together. I hate using epoxies for anything if I don't have to, because then you need to use some kind of agent to get the glue out. Um, so I try to avoid it at all, if at all possible. This is not going to work just gluing it together with, say, a uh, rubber cement or something. There's going to be movement. What we need is firmly held, and so that's what the fold does for us. And our final step in the exercise will be clearing the, the cover, the, the line that we've cut away. So now it becomes a sawing exercise because what I did last time was I marked my center line and I marked a couple of crosshatch points, including what we'll see as the place that the stone is going to set. I don't know if you guys can see that with my fingers in the way, but the stone is gonna rest right down in this red block, right? Because these are going to be folded out and slotted together. And then my stone will be sitting plunk, right down in the cutaway that I'm about. Well, I'm going to do that cutaway last, but that's the spot. And the stone will sit there. Let me get you the example that I finished already so that you can see what I'm talking about. So if you look at this one from the top down, plonk, what I did, these were, these were both on top of each other with this shape. So the fold line was up top right about here, and I was cutting the pair of them so that they are the same from all directions, right? And then when we cut them apart, the only difference that's going to happen between the two parts is one is getting a slice cut from the top, 
and one is getting a slice cut from the bottom and they're going to scissor together. Okay, does that make sense for what we're headed towards? This is a setting that looks a lot more complex than it is. Once you get the concept of it, there's a whole lot of, oh, there's so much possibility out of this, right? Yeah. But it takes cool. this precision. Questions? Did I hear somebody asking? Yeah, is that a bullet or is it flat? This is a bullet. The one that I'm putting in today is just a traditional tab. This is an uh, eight millimeter, fairly basic domed manufactured ruby, I think. Right, but um, you can do this with the bullets. You can do this with the traditional cabs and you can do it with faceted stones. And that's one that people said last time that they'd like to see and I'll come back to it after we've done some other projects. Um, but again, the concept, it, it, this, it, this works better. It, it's easier, I should say. It doesn't work better necessarily. The stones should be relatively proportional, meaning this is not an easy design to do for an abstract stone. But as you'll see from some of his pictures, including page 118, you can do more than two cross hatches. You're just not going to have as easy a time making them. So in that bottom model, you would be doing your two little side crosses together like this so that they get matched. And then you would make the longer piece separately, right? And then these two would both get slotted one way and the bottom piece would get slotted the other. Okay, so again, the profile of this is where you get all kinds of variety and both in the drawings he's given us and in the front and the back of the book, there are some variations on the theme. Um, and this is one that it's easier to have it laid out ahead of time, like you don't want to sort of rough it, because it's very important that even left, right, and up, down are mirror images of each other. And if you don't want to do it mapped out on here, do it on a piece of label paper or something and label stick it down. Um, you could you could literally even do these in a CAD program or something and print labels that you can use over and over again to cut these so that you're just always making the same profile. Uh, what I'm going to do to start, though, is I'm going to cut my bottom circle. Oh, and that's the other tool I wanted to remind you of. Whether you get it for jewelry or whether you get one at the local craft store, the different shapes, as long as you have these markers that tell you top and bottom, it's going to make your life so much easier for laying out patterns. Like I played around with this and I thought, oh, maybe I want the oval profile down at the bottom, but I didn't end up liking how that looked proportionally to everything else. So then I moved to the circles and went and found a circle that was of the size I wanted. But because I have those lines, I just line them up with my already marked out center line and mark out the, the pattern I want. And then when I wanted to do the side bits, I chose, I think, a tiny oval. And again, came in and just marked out side and side by lining up my lines to the mark that I, or the edge in this case. It was the next size up that I used. There we go. And mark them out. And that way I'm getting the same on both sides. Again, either doing it on the image on the piece or doing it on a label on a graphics program or something to get nice mirror images there's some wonderful like do the left side and fold it over and it becomes a paper doll image of itself things in most graphics programs so if you create just this much profile and then mirror it from from one side over mirror it and print it out that's a good way to go it also lets you get some nice precise measurement or to scale things on your graphics program. But John wants us doing some of the things that we learn out of the gate by hand. And so I laid this one out by hand. Um, and you're going to want to use a, a, a fairly solid blade because remember, we're not just going through the gauge on this that we started with, which I think was 22, if I recall, maybe it was 20, 20 gauge, but we're going through a double thickness of it. So we want a slightly heavier blade than we would go through. I'm going to go up to, what am I going to go up to? Rachel? Yeah? Now I'm, I'm looking at the, at the pictures of the book. There yeah. are several here that are with a faceted stone. Is that yes. what you're talking about? So this, this project I'm doing with a uh, cabochon, but you but can, you can also, use... 
You can absolutely use it faceted. I'm going to recommend that the first one or two of these that you do start with a cab. It gets enormously more complicated to get this part framed in, matching your, um, your layout for a, a faceted stone. So that's what people said they were interested in me doing another one of these for faceted. So I'll demo that later in the, in the series. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Miss yep. Rachel, you need to yep. clean yourself. Oh, thank you. Goodness. No wonder I've been looking so small up on screen. And I am recording. There we go. Much better. <laughs> you guys are probably been peering at this itty bitty pattern. Do I need to repeat any of those things that I was showing? Center line, marked out where my um, stone is going to rest, marked out the pattern equally on both sides. This is our top that's still put together, but barely. All good? All right. And I am going with a one blade for this. If that becomes too uh, hard to control, I'll switch down to a finer blade. But because I'm going through double thickness, I really want to have a good clean fit. And this is one of those things where it's small and hard to manage. So you may want to use a, uh, a, a vice or a ring clamp like I'm going to try um, just to get control over it. And I try to do a half at a time or a portion, you know, one segment at a time, not try to set it up for everything. So in this case, just going to set it up enough that I can get in here and work on, you guys still see me, yes. I'm going to work on just the bottom piece. And on these, I tend to cut inside my marks. And then I'm going to file to the marks because I want such precision. So even though my I could try to saw the red line, I know my skills are not always up to snuff on getting a perfect cut every time. But I can file off till I get to the color. I'm going to leave myself a little excess, more excess than I might to. Really awkward to keep in view for you guys and still. Take a little more of that off by saw before I go to the files. Okay. And before I move on, I'm going to actually file finish my profile on this. So um, because it's a nice round curve, I think I'm going to see if my chainsaw file will do the trick for this because it's got such a nice round profile. Yeah, that's good. It's not great. Let's see how it does. then it becomes really, really important that you keep an eye on matching both pieces, left and right. So don't overdo things. And for those of you that joined a little bit late, in case you missed it, there's a code Zoomers23 that you can use if you'd like to register for any of the uh, workshops I'll be teaching in 2023 um, or any that I have set up already. Okay, I got to go a little bit more finessed than that round file. So, Rachel. Yeah. In the design, you had the top part where you're going right now with the file. You had it, you had it like a line straight, 
but now you're going to go like with the round file. So this is the base of the setting, which if you look at the bottom of page 118, he has the traditional cab slash bullet shape um, on the bottom right drawings. You see how he's got sort of a curved base below the legs of it. We're looking just to the upper right above, just above the um, uh, emerald cut sort of boat shape, the one up to the right of that. I'm going for a profile that emulates that leg because when these get rotated and put opposite each other, they're gonna create that curvature. So up top, this is, this is the bottom. What you might've been seeing was where I'm gonna put the straight line for the base of the, for the, for the floor of the, of the cabochon. So right, that'll, that'll be one of my last cuts because I don't wanna cut apart the, the two parts too early. I need to get all my detailing done first. So I'm using a crossing file just to give a little bit of cleanup to it because I'm seeing a little bit more material on one edge than on the other. Let's take this out a smidge. Never hurts to use your good old calipers and see how you're doing for widths and so on. I have a suspicion I'm still a little narrower on this side than I am on the front, two, six, seven. My goodness, am I that much off? Wow. Yeah, I've got a ways to go off on the one side. So the challenge with this is because it's so precise and parallel, if you don't, if you, this is one of those, if you don't take the right steps early on, you, you're going to end up regretting it because it'll multiply as you work your way down the design. Meaning if you haven't done a good measurement, you're going to see things start to get off the sides. Back to my circle a little bit, I think. We got more curve coming off of one edge than off the other. Let's I'm just trying to get the profile the same on both halves. Closer, but it's still not quite there, I think. Yeah, it's still a little rough. And one of the things you'll discover is you got to sort of flip it around and go work on the back side of it as well, because sometimes you'll get a little off on the filing, you know, on the angle that you're filing when you're coming through two pieces. And we can do tiny touch-ups later, but again, this is one of those, the better you can make it from the get-go, the happier you will be with your outcomes. Okay. 
a bit off. There's this one spot that just doesn't want to file down. I'm going to call that good. All right, so I've got now the base cut away, and now I'm going to work on the edge, the sides, to get a profile there. And this I could do completely by saw, just like I did the other part, or I could um, use a drill bit and get the nice clean cut there. I think I'm going to start with a saw to take some material down. <laughs> I can use files if I don't have the drill bits that have the profile I want. Now, are you going through the sequence of steps on page 120? Page 120? Yes, I should be. Oh, he did the top first for the faceted stone. I can see why he wants that. Um, but I did such a, a narrow profile up at the top that if I cut away my center first, then, so I'm not going in quite the order he's going uh, in. Ah, okay, um, got you. I don't have enough material up here to hold my piece together, um, but I can see why he'd want us to on the facet because that's the most important, everything centers around how you've laid that out okay. um, when you've got a culette that has to cut down. Okay, so we forget about that for now. Pardon? No, don't forget about it. If you no, want, I'm so not going to forget about it. I'm just not going yeah, to. Yeah. Um, if I had left myself more material on either edge, then I think I could have done it in the order he's got. But I'm really worried. There's So there's such a tiny top profile for what I'm going to have left that I was really worried I'd cut too much away and they would come apart before I was ready for it. So that's okay. the reason I did it in the in the order I did. Sorry, mm -hmm. I didn't. I should have refreshed myself on his order of operation in the book. Okay. You know, uh, Rachel, I heard you say something about glue. You don't like to use epoxy? I'm not a huge fan just because then you have to, you, first of all, I end up spilling it everywhere because I'm a slob. And second of all, I don't like having to put it in the acetone to get it clear. No, I I, I, I was taught a different way and it's super fast if you, yeah. if you, if you, uh, your setting has a, a little event, a vent, right? Yeah. So what they do is they use the torch, but they use it very fast. I mean, like you- To burn off the, um, isn't yes. that incredibly toxic? Oh but goodness. you use a hot flame and you use a tweezer to weigh the piece that you want to separate. So it happens like super, really fast. Okay, I'd be more concerned about the fumes. But the fumes are going with the with the thing that you have there, the vent. You the put vent, it right yeah. there. The vent. I don't know. I just thought I'd tell you because it makes things way easier. Just yeah. them. sure. I believe it that it burns off. Um, I'm just extra cautious about burning any chemicals. Right, so that right. Really do a bad job of ventilating my space. Right. Uh, but yeah, by all means. Okay, so I've got a rough cut in here. I'm gonna do the same rough cut in on the other side so I can keep flip flop flopping when I start filing. And just like with the bottom cut, I'm leaving myself excess when I'm gonna do the cleanup with files and or in this case, I might use a barrel burr to get myself a good clean cut into these side bits. In fact, I think that's exactly what I'll do. Just start and get a matched set. Uh, where's my nice barrel burr? There we go, so that's the right size. And then how do you know how if you how much space uh, you should leave to be safe? I mean, like right now, let's say I'm well, I am going to start cutting. What size piece do I begin with? 
for um, so, that's a, so that's why you draw it all out first on paper. Remember, we we laid this one out um, roughly on yeah. graph paper so that you see that you have enough material. And there's two uh, things that are most important. So he, you can have lots of upper profiles as long as you have enough material that you can push forward. Because it, just like setting the stone, you're using your four top pieces to fold over. And if it's narrow at the top, you can sometimes just push them over. But John also shows us um, how you have to slice. And he shows that on page, I think it's on the next page. Uh, yeah, up on um, page 122, he shows how you make a really fine slice if you want a heavy profile on the prong. Aha, uh -huh. yes, yeah, I see it. Yep. So it's not quite so screaming. Like that. So the nice thing about using a burr for this instead of a uh, file is it's a nice clean profile. So I see how clean that is. It's a nice finished look. And then all I have to do is clean up the upper half. Um, but you can absolutely just do these with hand files. Okay, so I've got my bottom profile and my side profile nicely laid out. Now I've got to clean up the upper edge before I end up cutting away where my where my stone is going to sit. Because um, again, I'm worried. John's layout has us doing this one first usually, um, but I was worried about having too small a profile holding the metal together at the top. So with this, I'm going to move up to a bigger file because as always, use the largest file you can. And I'm just working to that outline that I created before to get visual and proportional matches on both sides. Got a little rough on the sawing on one side, so I gotta do a fair amount of cleanup. And this is actually, it's a lot easier to see where the problems are. Let's see if I can put this on something of black paper still like something that'll show for you guys so you can see nice and clean where I used the the bit but there's a little bit of a burble on the lower half I'm going to try and correct that and it looks like I need to do a little bit more cleanup so I'm looking at the back side I marked up this side and that's what I've been working off of but I sometimes can see the uh, off balance issue if I flip it over and look at the, the clean side so top Right corner needs a little bit of curve to match. And I want to fix up this little blip I've got. This curve. Okay, so. Now I'm ready to go and I'm going to have to remark it because it's gone and hidden itself in, as I get Sharpie marks all over my hands. Here is the area that I laid out for the stone. And this one in particular, super important that you cut inside your mark, right? Because this is the area that your stone needs to sit in snugly. So you're going to want to work to fitting with your files. Do not try to hand cut it unless you are far more agile with your saw than I am. If you're John Mazaros, you can just hand cut it because he's magic like that. Um, but for, for us mere mortals, I recommend cutting inside of your lines. Inside enough.
That includes the very bottom that's going to be where the stone is setting. So leave yourself excess to cut away with files. Am I blocking? Yeah, you guys are having a hard time. Let's see if I can rotate myself. There we go. Okay, so before I am ready to file these apart, I need to get a little cleanup done and I'm checking to see how close my stone is to fitting. It should be able to sort of rest on the on the create on the flat we've created. So I've got a lot more cleanup to do on this. No surprise since I left all that extra. And on this one, I'm going to go for my barrette file to get a nice flat bottom surface without taking too much, you know, without bumping up against the edge and cutting in. Taking it down to the lines that I scored into things right off of the bat. And then I'm going to work to widen it left, right. Again, I'm using the barrette file because that way I'm not creating a gouge where uh, the file meets the bottom. And this is one that you want to go back and forth to each side, because again, we're trying to make them mirror images of one another. And if you've done a too small a profile at the top, don't be surprised if while you're doing this filing, they separate. Try to make sure that you have enough material that that doesn't happen. Another way I could have solved that is following his order of operations, I would have not taken down this side material yet. I don't check how my fit is getting. No, nope, I've still got a little bit more I need left, right. And it's so cold in Portland that I turned up my heat a degree more than usual, and it's enormously hot in the studio today. To open some doors. Either that or I'm just working up a good sweat doing all this sawing, playing in the sanding, filing. There's something really satisfying about this setting as you get it cleaner and cleaner because you're it's the precision is important to it. And when you see it happening right, you see the precision that you're getting, you see the match. Um, and so it's always been a frustrating one for me because as you guys know, I like fewer measurements and more abstract um, when I'm working. But uh it's definitely one of those things that ups your, your skill set on other for, for other types of projects.
as you get down to the last bits of it, check frequently because it can be a matter of a tiny adjustment to get you in there. Boop. Stone is super slippery. I forgot I have wax for that. I've got a good half a millimeter I gotta clear away still. Tiny bit more. Let's see if I have a file that's not so grubbed up as the gun. Okay, up at the top, we're getting to the right amount, but I've got a little bit of an angle on my filing. So I need to straighten that out. In the pictures that he's doing the faceted version of, you'll notice there's a little bit more critical uh, hook that has to go in that creates the equivalent of us using files on a prong setting to cut away for the facets for the um, for the for the edge of the stone. Um, so the nice thing about starting with a flat stone like a cab is that we don't have that challenge on our initial sawing and filing. Oh, so close, I can taste it. And that's when you can go south, so. Pardon? <laughs> and that's when you can go south. <laughs> this is when you can go south, did you say? Yeah. Oh, Those yeah. For me. The last little bits. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's why you check it frequently as you go, because it can change. Now, will this one be a problem if I get microscopically bigger than I want to? No, but it's still getting pegged on four sides by the by the, the prongs. They're not quite technically prongs, but the snugger you can make the fit, the easier it will set. Gonna fit in at the top, but it's not gonna fit all the way down. I think I'm going to leave it there and touch up anything after that once I get it soldered. So we now have a relatively mirror image version of itself, two pieces still stuck together by those tiny, tiny little bits of metal up at the top, right? Um, 
again, if you want, you can glue and uh, just just be careful not to get glue all over everything and you're good. Um, now I need to make sure that I can do the center line because what we're going to do on one half, need a smaller pen than that, on one half, we're going to put a slot here. And on the other half, we're going to put a slot here. But I need to, I don't, I realize I don't have my center line marked across. So I got to make that mark. I'm going to do that with, we'll make sure that it's actually straight. Oops, for that one. Oh, so this is going to be a little tricky. Let's see. my handy dandy measuring tool and center myself properly. There is a lot of measuring in this project. It's huge amounts of measuring in this project because of that precision factor. And that's why I say, as much as I hate the measuring, I love that I get practice in being more precise. So much like chain making is a good practice for soldering, right. this is a good practice for all of your other work being a little more precision oriented. You know what I'm doing? I, have, I have my telephone. I have you drawing in my yeah. telephone and then I have you over here uh, measuring also. <laughs> okay. So from you, last you week, I was the last asking, session? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Looking at, wow, there is so much measuring. There is a lot in this one. Seven. But it's good because I hate measuring. Yep, me too. Me too. And I still think there needs to be like an Alexa version of one of these where I can just tell it. I guess cell phones are starting to do that, but they're not on the scale we need them. Ah, uh, yeah, I didn't think about that. Because it's the 0.01s that do me in. I'm just trying to make sure I didn't go off center on my original layout. And it looks like I'm in pretty good shape there. So now, let's see if I can get this a cleanly drawn line. All right. And here is the single most important part of your measurements on this. The slots that we're making need to be just shy of one sheet of metal's thickness. This is where I invariably screw up because we need to have just enough room that we're going to file it so it is a snug fit. Let me draw that on my board because I'll share with you the pain of having done all this measuring, done all this precision work, only to have it fall apart on you. Because what we, what we will have once we cut these apart, let me do the shape that I'm doing here. So that's what we got. Okay, so I'm doing that. And there's a second one of the same shape. It's gonna look different because I don't have room on my whiteboard because I started too big, but you get the gist. Okay, so this one is going to get a slot like that cut away. And this one is going to get a slot like that cut away. Oops, I'm not on screen, am I? There we go. So this is one cut away and that's the other cut away. Um, these are literally going to be 
this thickness of metal slotting down in here. So when we put them together, it sounds obvious when you say it and when you think about it, but invariably this is the place that I managed to screw up is that I make these gap this gap wider than the thickness of the metal. Because I always think about the two metal to get pieces of metal together, and that is not what we want. We want these separate, and I think he actually even has us separate them because we have to to cut them. Yep. So we're basically on, we're about to hit step nine where we cut off the tops or we file off the tops if there's not a lot of material. And then we're going to cut into 10. Um, and his drawings aren't really scale on that 10. Um, but whatever this width here, is is the thickness of your metal by the time you're done filing and cleaning it up does that make sense yes i i got it all right so i'm going to now do the trimming off of those last two pieces and i've got so little material up top that i should be able to do this with just a quick filing to, to file off the top two connectors See, I got one of them. I think this one needs a little more. Yep, there we go. Two, hopefully mirrored image so that when I put them together either direction, they match nicely. You can still do a tiny amount of cleanup at this stage if you need to. Like I've got a little bit height of height on one. I'll take that off at the end once I've got them so, uh, stitched together or soldered together. And so now I need to mark my cross point because I need one to come halfway down from one direction and one to go halfway up from the other direction. I don't want to overcut them. Um, so my height on this is at that center point it is 3.65. So 1.5, 1.8. This is my center that I'm cutting down to. Let's put a marker so I can actually keep it there. Same thing on the other one. And the reason I'm checking it from both sides is if I am ever so slightly off, then what that gives me is two marks and I can draw the line in between them. And so on one, I'm going to saw just that part. And on the other, I'm going to saw just that part. And again, thickness of my metal in this case is 0.79. I'm getting two different thicknesses. Hang on. Looks like 0.83, yeah, 0.83 ish. Um, so I'm going to err on the side of caution. But again, my line has to be centered down that middle. So I'm going to do a 0.4. From each center. From the center point. That is not scoring the way I want. Hang on a sec. Do I have my dividers? Where did I put them? I hate it when I clean up and can't find things.
I mean, I'm getting good gauge measurement. I don't remember what gauge this actually ended up being. I think it was the 20 gauge, but I can never quite trust. 0.84 is what I'm getting for gauge. So 0.42. Do a point four to give myself a little edge. Okay, I'm it there, I guess. Way too wide. So one going up and one coming down. I'm not measuring well, so I'm gonna actually trim even less than I have marked out because of my concern that I'm gonna leave it too wide. But I absolutely am gonna stop as I hit that middle point oh i also have to drop my saw blade down because i've still got i've got a double thickness saw blade on so it's too coarse for what i'm cutting so switch to a finer saw blade going to a traditional two aughts which is my go-to for anything in the 20 to 22 range of material oh my. So I'm taking just the barest bit less than I need and double check before you cut your second one. I have screwed this up by cutting the same cut on both halves and that is no good. I need to have one from the top and one from the bottom for this hard cut to work for us. At this point, it's such a narrow little cut that I'm basically just using the saw blade as a file to clean it up. So itty bitty, and I can check and see how close I am by slotting them together. This is the exciting part. Is it gonna fit? No, not yet, it's too narrow. I went, I went, I erred on the side of too cautious. So I'm gonna actually grab a file that uh, Charles Luton Brain modified for me in a, in a class I was taking with him that he showed me how to do on the grinder. He ground down the back of my favorite, the, um, the back of the uh, barrette file to make the profile on it much thinner and then uh, polished it up to get it smooth. Actually, this one may not be the one Charles made because I've made some since then. Um, but what it does is it lets you get in to these itty bitty spaces, but with a consequential enough amount that you can still file. I say, thinking that I can get in here, and I maybe I need an even thinner one. You can also use your mini files, or again, you can just very cautiously use a fine saw, fine tooth saw blade, and have it act as a file. But what I'm doing is just trying to open these up a smidge at a time. I didn't lose my other half. That would devastate me. Where'd my other half go? Row, row. All right, now comes the big search. Anybody see it on my bench and I'm looking right past it? Where's the other hand? Oh, this will make me cry. Must have dropped it to the floor or something. Hear it drop. One. Hooey, guys. This is, this is, we're just at the right moment for actually finishing. And then 
have to go and do something silly like move a part. Okay, time to move some off the bench because I don't need you. I don't need you. It's in front of you. Pardon? Are you looking for the other piece? For the other half, yeah. It's right in front of you. I see it from here. This go one? Straight. Oh. Go forward. On there your desk. I couldn't there, see there the reflection. You go. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. It. it was just in the reflection wrong. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I, have a, I have an eyeglasses appointment in a few days. I need it. Um, if you, you have, have teeny tiny uh, square or square files, or again, our beloved chenier files, the teeny tiny ones that we use for hinge making, um, those are another good one for this. If you've got one thin enough, I'm not sure mine is, well, it might be just barely thin enough. This is probably a little bit loose. A little squared up. Thinner file. All right, let's try the magic and see what we got. Okay, they click together, but I did not go far enough up. My halfway mark is a little too, I'm being, I'm being silly. I need to go further than halfway. Is that right? No, I shouldn't need to go further than halfway. Should be. Oh, I just haven't gone fully halfway on one of them. I'm way far off my halfway mark. Hold on a sec. Let me do a little more sawing there. Again, do this in tiny, tiny little fits. You don't want to overdo it at this stage of the game when you put all this time and effort into this particular setting. Yes, we are. Nope, I still need to go further. Am I missing the dimensions we need to go? No, just not far enough along. Oh, I see. I'm not to even remotely square on one of these. Again, you've got a lot of marker and marks on one side. Um, sometimes just turning it over shows you what is not in line, and that was the case in mine. Oh, very close. I need to go a little further down. What I'm aiming for, and I've already gone a little wider than I should in my filing because my file is ever so slightly wider than the material. What I'm looking for is for that center to lie flush so that my cross hatch just sits there and my stone's going to sit on top of it. But we are very close. What I need is many, many files. Tinier than I've got. Ooh, but I have actually. There we go. This time I actually dropped it. Here, if I have a different brand. Sometimes switching to a different manufacturer will mean you get a slightly finer file. So let me see what I have that is smaller. Square or Maybe 
doesn't have in her profile. Ooh, it does. Yes. Okay. So my micro, my Euro tools are a little bit finer than the other set I was using. Plus, it's a good excuse to buy more tools. Oh, no, that one won't fit at all. I must have a different set of files. This is another check often. You can overdo it. Close, but not there yet. If any of you can figure out what the Zoom function is that I need to speed up all my filing for you on screen, that'd be awesome. As long as I can speed it up here in person too. Usually is when you have a backup already done, just like the cooks. <laughs> <laughs> Julia Child style. So we're getting closer, gang. So you can start to see what the profile is going to be like once we've got it fully set together. And again, this one I've got a little loose because of the files I chose. So I'm going to have a little left, right wiggle because of that, which it's not so bad that I won't be able to do the cheat with a little bit of solder. Um, but it's not as precise as I would like it for a really snug fit, because it means the snugger the fit, the easier the soldering part is gonna be because it'll hold itself um, at 90 degrees for us. I have already gone far enough on the thing that I need to use the other file. Oh, my fingernails thickness difference now. It's Not quite. One more little filing. I forgot what gauge are you using? I, I'll double check, but I'm pretty sure it's 20 gauge. Um, he has a range of gauges that he recommends sort of based on size. That's what yeah. I was going to ask you. How yeah. do I know when to use 20 or 14 or 16? Well, so some of it is stylistic. If you that, That's actually a great question specific to this setting. Depending on how you're enclosing your prongs, like this one, I may just be able to bend the prongs instead of having to do a slice. But if you go with a heavier gauge, that's okay. Just know that you're going to have to be slicing and creating a little pat panel like he shows us on page uh, 122. So you could have huge, thick, like sturdy, big pieces around it. You could do, you know, 16 gauge. You can do even heavier than that if you want to give the profile. Because what it is is the structure and the 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 architecture of the piece, the only thing that's really holding it is whatever we push down onto the stone right. from the yeah. interior. So yeah, this is a great one for playing with your gauges. Um, I wouldn't go smaller than 20 for stones of this size if you're going much smaller, but you can see how hard it is for me to get the slot. And you can see it's looser than it should be on that slot. We want that ideally to have no movement when we're in there so that we don't have the possibility of going that way. Although 
you can intentionally do that. If we were doing yeah. a three a three part, yeah. we could have another one that cuts across that way so that it's creating a, a crown like effect. Right. Um, in which case you just have to file in your angles to get the slots to slot together. Right. So, but we're going for the most basic at this point, which is the squared up parallel to one another. And we are in good shape. Yeah, we're at soldering soldering point at this time. So I'm going to bring it over to the bench. My tools that I've been flinging around me out of the way. And before I actually solder this, I'm going to show you guys a little up close on it so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, let me get there. Too close. There we go. So we've got, when it's working right, it sits, right? It sits as it should. If it's not well filed enough, you might have one of the legs or two of the legs coming off the ground while the others stay, stay there, or it may be tipping. And if it's a snug fit, I won't have that wobble. So in a perfect world, this would be literally slotted in with no room for it to move left, right. That's how precise we want it to get. But as it stands, it's got enough. You can see there's a tiny, like not even a fingernail's thickness, if I'm in the screen, not even a fingernail's thickness gap that we should be able to solder fill. We'll just be using a little more solder than we want. So here's a trick if you're gonna be lining things up, draw on your bench block, use that template and make yourself some marks. They're just gonna burn off. So I'm gonna put, I'm gonna find something that is the size of my pieces and put marks down at my corner points. That one's gonna be hard to reach there. And make my little cross hatch on the block. Oops, I'm out of zoom now. So I've drawn in this little cross hatch that I'm gonna set this on and make sure that I'm lined up with it while I'm soldering. So there's a good spot for me. Make sure that if I've got any tilt to it, I'm as upright as I can be. Fluxing, staying on those lines, checking everything. And as, as often as possible we do, we're gonna use hard solder for this. And in fact, I don't want chip solder. I need a good sized chunk of solder. So I only have chip out. Let me cut a couple pieces off. And something I can work with. You could do a little stick soldering on this one if you've got a delicate touch with it. I'm going to always try to start with just a beaded up bit so that I don't overflow. Because everything I put down is going to show in the corners. And I want to have as little cleanup to do as possible. I already have a fair amount of cleanup I have to do just because of how much marking up of the work I did. So just putting it right. Get my pick to behave. Right up at the top, right where they cross hatch. Oh, I got a little bit of connection there, but not quite as much as I want. Oh, maybe I did get as much as I want. Now that looks... Oh yeah, hey, I got our four sides. So what I'm looking at was the, um, I saw it flow this way. I didn't see it flow this way, but it did actually manage to get all the quadrants. So all that, all that hard cutting and filing and other stuff, and then one quick solder and blammo, you have this amazing setting. So it's her, it's, it's slow, 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 quick at the end. That's great, you and made it. Yeah, right? 
And um, yes. there's, you know, we can do some minor adjustments with pliers if it's a little out of true and we're going to pickle it and sand it and file it and so on. You can put some kind of a hang, you know, bail of some kind if you design that in. Um, this is a fun little setting. It's just a lot of work to get you there. And it's one that if you decide you like to use it in your work, I would highly recommend you come up with a couple templates and get them onto your computer so that you can print them and reuse them. And then it'll become like any other exercise that you do over and over again. And you'll become really good at measuring and filing and sanding down things. And, and I would even, my template would include the cutaways so that I know from the outset which half I'm doing. I would put one label on one half and one label on the other half, lining them up um, if I'm gonna do that. Questions? Well, I put that in the pickle. Anyone? How many people are gonna actually try this one? Well, I, I am definitely, but I need to go again over the drawing, the drawing. Yeah, yeah. Again, start with a cabochon. Don't try, yeah. don't try and start with the, uh, <laughs> with the, with the faceted one it'll just frustrate you no no i have a cab ready here good anybody else gonna try it good cindy i think that this is for your students this would be a great challenge project for your students that want to level up on their sawing and their other techniques yeah i think i like this one yeah um, and and I want to see all the varieties that you guys do for profiles, because I actually find that that's where I get jammed up on it the most is the possibilities and trying to think flat, knowing that it's going to go to dimensional is like, I do so much better with three dimensional objects in my hand than working from a pattern out to something else. So I fight like I, I threw away three different sketches that I decided I didn't like. You guys saw I did a different design on the same square the last time. And I was looking at it, I was like, that's not what I want for a profile. That's not going to work. So play with that. Um, and paper dolls, man, paper dolls, everything. Do this on a piece of paper, fold it up, cut it out, make two of them. So you're doing it just like you do the actual material. So you're putting them together in a fold. Then you're folding it in half and you're cutting out your profile, and then you can cut them apart and paper slot them together. I would probably do it out of a heavier cardboard if I'm going to do that, but it, it's model it, man. This is one of the things that really needs modeling to get the different possibilities uh, out of that. Any other questions on the crazy stuff we went through on this one? Mm. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Looking at the like I told you on my telephone, I'm looking at the drawing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to pop to the other room for just a second to grab. I've been tumbling the emerald cut, uh, the emerald settings from last time. And one that I did that made me happier, because as we recall, I ended on a sour note with it being a tiny bit too small. So I'm going to show you what I discovered about that. Yes, Bet, Bet Betsy, go ahead. Uh, I just have a quick question. Um because I'll, I'll probably try this. It'll probably be a disaster, but I have a set of the joint files yep. and they're all by, um, by uh, gauge actually. So, um, cause Otto, Otto Fry sells them that they're equivalent to different gauges of, um, of silver, uh, of metal. Yeah. Um, so could I just, uh, saw a line and then file that line with with the the appropriate. I, I'm not yeah, real good theoretically. Without okay. it, you saw down the middle line and then work your way on it. Uh, the thing yeah. I would caution is test see whether they're true to gauge or whether the, when they say they're to gauge, they're actually the thickness that the metal is. In which case, you step down to a smaller one and work up yeah, and they, and just do they're up. a little a little below like the um instead uh the the point what what is uh 22 gauge is what 0. 0.6 so it's like a 0. 0.57 or something oh nice okay so they're true to gauge that's fantastic yeah tell us how they work and then i might have to buy some more files okay <laughs> um let me pop in and grab the the settings and we'll we will do a little stone setting today too
What kind of files are you talking about, Betsy? Um, Otto Fry calls them joint files. They're the the um, Viorbe. Um, and it, it's in, it's on their website. If you put in joint files. Ah, okay. Thank you. Joint. Okay, I put the stones that go in these now. Uh, let me clean up a little bit on my bench before I start bringing additional tools into the mix. Too many things in the way. Hmm. I don't need this, maybe need this off of this. All right, so here is what we have. The one that I actually did on screen and the one that I did a little bit larger. Um, and I tried to be, uh, I tried to be exacting to John's directions, except I again felt like it was too big and you guys will see what I mean um, on this redo that I did but it's just barely too big. It's like you have to just sort of think smaller than the actual measurement rather than taking it all the way down. It's the right direction. One direction looks better than the other. Let's go that way. The right ones in the set. Yes, that's the one I put for that one. So again, when I had when I realized it was too small, the first thing I tried was to see if my other stone was by any chance a smaller stone, and it was not. And then the next thing I did was think about whether I can cut away. So what we get, um, you guys actually see, let me see if I can zoom a little bit for you. Sorry, gang, I'm going to have fingers in my screen for a minute. I'm going to actually switch over to the other camera so that I don't make you guys dizzy while I try to zoom with this camera. It's too zoomed. Okay, Ugh, it's a fuzzy picture, but hopefully you'll get the sense of what I'm trying to point out about this, which is, this is this is the one that I made during the on-screen time. And this is the one that I was uh, arrogantly sure I needed to make smaller than the literal widths of everything. Um, but to me, this one seats better, whereas this done to full size, feels like it's going to fall off, basically. Like it's too far from the edge. And what I really want is somewhere right in between. I want the Goldilocks factor, right? I personally want to barely see the metal beyond this. Like this, I've trimmed it too close, meaning I made it a little too short on my long sides in particular. The ends I kept consistent, so those are pretty good on both. Um, but I feel like this, this is... Like it's too far away from the prongs for me to be comfortable that it's going to stay well held. Um, that is purely opinion. And that is not going by John's directions in the book. Um, just that that's my difference. You know, this one is going to, this, you can even see it as I try to hold it in place. It wants to sort of shift off its setting. I'm not in screen. There we go. It doesn't, it's, really barely hanging on in the corners. And this one goes the opposite direction, which is it overhangs too much. So what I had to do to make this even come close to fitting is I filed away 
just like we did when we did some of our earliest prong settings. Now, I have not finished the filing because that's what we're going to do on today's setting, but I basically turned my round wire into half round wire for each of the corners. And then I did a little bit of inset the way that we would for, uh, oops, I'm out of screen, the way that we would do for um, any traditional prong with a faceted stone because we've got a little cutaway and we're going to do it. We're going to finish that up. Um, but we're going to try and set the, the right one um, first. So that's been my adventures. I've been making freaking octagonal shaped frames like nobody's business for the last couple of weeks trying to get my game on this. I'm going to switch back for just a minute so I can zoom back out without killing you guys. Um, and, uh, the other thing that you can do if you need to, it, or if you say decided to make your frames with square wire or rectangle wire is that you could file a bit of an angle, a bevel, so that the stone sits a little more solidly into this. Um, I'm going to do this one first because it's the cleaner one. Um, and so I just want to, as I ha as we learned on the round, the very first one, the front round prongs, we want to know where our stone actually hits the um, the prongs. So I'm just marking my spots, trying to keep it in a stable position while I do. Except my pen is dying, so that's not doing me much good. Bear with me. I get slip slidey. Staying foot. And in this style, remember that each of our eight points is at risk if we put too much pressure down on it. Um, so we still need some cutaway on that. Um, we, have, we, we learned over the course of our earlier settings a couple of different ways to do that. One being the hand filing method and the other being a heart burr. I'm going to do a couple prongs one way and a couple prongs the other. Um, and I got to remember, he likes us to start these with our crossing file. Let me go back to that position. So, uh, he wants us to start with, oh, no, we start with the round file. Um, at the, he, so he wants us to use a round, so the round, which is my round. Around to put in the initial cut, and then we move to the crossing file. Little tiny rounds. There we go. Uh, the nice thing about the um, the emerald setting is that you're sort of hitting two prongs at a time. So I'm following my marks across both of them to start, and I'm going just at the bottom of the marks that I made. And right now I have a considerable excess of material above where my prongs are actually going to end. Just putting in that first set. Down at the bottom again. And I'll go straight. Again, we would do all our finishing, all our polishing, everything cleaning up before we'd even do the setting. And obviously any soldering down that you need to do would happen before that as well. 
but clean up before you get into your final set. And all I did in this case was a tiny bit of filing and tumble. I would do a lot more cleanup for a finished product. All right, so there's two started with the hand file. Let's see if I've got the touch today to go to using my uh, my my heart burr. Do you recommend a seventy or ninety? Do you recommend the ninety? I think. Oh, it's kind of heart burr. That's going to do the trick. about right. I gave myself a Christmas present and got a quick change and I should have done it years ago. The change hand pieces are delightful except for the fact that they don't make one in the right size for larger burrs. This is why I don't like the birds as much. I jump them. Ah. All the way around. I just need to practice with my heart first so I get more control. All right, so let me see if I can do anything that will make these show up for you on the camera so you guys can see the difference. I actually am liking the curved cut of the round a little better. Let me bring it over to the zoom in camera. Too close. Okay, so I have now cut in two here with heart burrs, right in the screen. No, nope, wrong direction, there we go. Uh, two, this, these two have been done with heart burrs for their first pass. And these have been done with just a round file, a narrow round file. I'm using my favorite uh, watchmakers round file. Um, and so this has so far just a circular profile, whereas the heart burr ones have an already cut in profile at an angle. Lower, and... lower your hand, lower your oh, hand. Thank you. There, there. There we go. So the heart burrs have a sort of angular cut in here, whereas the ones I did by hand have that gentle circle, half circle cut. There we go, half circle. So now I'm going to go back and do phase two, which is using the um, barrette file, the one that, remember, we polished the edge off of when we got to this kind of setting. Um, we polished, even though it comes smooth, you still want to take the, any roughness off of it. And we're going to, oops, no, sorry, I'm using the, that too soon. I need to be using the uh, crossing file next, because what we are doing is changing our shape So we started with round prongs. And with the file, we put in this. With the heart burr, we put in this 90 degree heart burr. And so our next step is to take this because we want to take a gentle curve. So this is going to be the crossing file taking away this material. Here's my beloved crossing file. Buried it. Okay, here we go. 
um, this first on the ones that I did with the round. And what I'm doing is working up from the round divot that I made to create that profile. I don't want to dig too deeply into the material because I don't want to weaken the fold point we're going to be making. So these I'm not trying to do both at once. I'm trying to actually focus on one half and then the other half of the pair. Just taking down some material over the top. I know every time I rotate it, it blocks the view for you guys. I have to get the angle. And now I'm going to do the same to the ones that I did with heart burr. They're going to be a little trickier to get in because they don't they have such a sharp angle. But the same effect happens. Theoretically, I could... Potentially, if I had better control than I personally do with my burrs, I could probably draw up with a burr. But I don't think I have that manual dexterity to not chop off a, a, a prong, which would make me cry after the amount of time that goes into these to set it up to this point. Yeah, so far, I think my preference for these would be to do the hand filing rather than the starting it even with the, with the 90 degree heart. I'm finding it's a little easier to clean up on the round ones, than, uh, the round file ones. All right, so next, I, I've now created, zoom again for you. <clears throat> I've now carved in. Oh, this is not going to get close enough for you guys to really see any angle that's going to get a visual. Yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to find the spot I need to be in that's just the right balance. So there, that's perfect. That's good. So you can hopefully see that we've got a little curve in at the bottom at the bottom and then it comes up at a bit of an angle. See if I can get you the side profile. Yeah, I don't know if I'm if, if it's showing well enough for you, but a little bit in there you can see some of the cutaway that I've done. And so I've done that on all four of them. And I'm going to do a tiny bit of cleanup with the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with the barrette file, just to get any rough edges straightened out. There's not a heck of a lot I have to do. I'm not actually trying to file away more material. I'm just trying to get bits and bobs that I may have put into it. Well, and there's one that needs a little deeper cut from the heart burr oh. side. Why did you why did you use uh, on some the round file and in the other the burr? Just just to, to remind you guys that there's more than one way to do this. In the book, oh. he covers both using both using hand files and using the uh, heart burr. Okay. And so I would only do one method if I were doing this for a finished project. And I'm just playing with. There are certain settings where I won't be able to comfortably get a heart burr in where I need it. This was more for my sake to prove that the heart burr could be used. Right. I would probably, my choice would probably be to do all of them by hand. Um, just because I'm liking the shape I'm getting on the ones that I did with by hand better. They feel a little more fitted to what I expect to need for the bend. But I'm just seeing a couple that aren't quite as deep as one of, as the others. Yeah, purely as a teaching technique. 
<laughs> I'm not expecting you to go and do two different styles of setting when you're in the middle of a setting. Okay, so I've now got positions where my prong can bend over the stone. It was I, I was again filing just below the line that I marked at the bottom edge of it. And then I was working my way up from it. And I can now start to see, let me clean up off my stone before I get it stuck in there. Marks I've got on it off. I can now see where I'm gonna be pushing down. And this is one of those uh, settings where John says, take a cut off toothbrush handle, plastic toothbrush handle and use it. Or I have, if I can figure out where I've hung it, I have an actual prong pusher that I like. Here we go. I think I've shown that to you, um, which is just a divot that helps hold. And this is the up and over at that fold point. We're not doing any of them all the way. We're just starting them to give ourselves a sense of how much we need to trim away still. And I want to do opposite corners. So I'm pushing a little in and a little up over, but not locking them in yet. Because I still have prong trimming to do and shaping. All right, so we can see that there's a whole lot of excess material up top. And I'm finding that these are definitely, this is feeling still big to me for this setting because I've got, uh, some of the prongs are getting in close enough, but others feel distant from the setting. And I feel like I'm going to have to sort of force them a little further down than I want to. So I'm still going to be playing with the correct measurement. And I think it's going to come down to a gut feeling of, you know, fingernails width less than the width of the stone, the diameters around the stone, except for the corners. I think the corners need to remain consistent. But again, I haven't played with them enough to have confidence. I just know that I'm not thrilled with how loose this is. All right, so now that I've got it at least partially down, so that side needs to be a little further down before I can put things. I just don't want the stone slipping out during this next phase. And I may need to do a little straightening. I can see that some of the prongs are leaning inward. So I'm going to take a pair of pliers and gently encourage them in the directions I want them to go, whether that's both pointing in or both parallel a little bit like this. I'm going to go with that because I like the double effect. It's twisting a little. All right, and now I'm going to start to see how much I want to trim away. It's not as much trimming as I thought I was going to need. Um, and we come back to my my bet noir, which is to figure out measurements. Um, and I'm going to grab my calipers and try to figure out a point I can use to determine how high up the stone I want these. I'm not quite sure. What I care about is that they've come up far enough to hold. But whether I'm measuring off of my bend point, I don't know. Let me see what I can come up with. May this, I may have to just eyeball this or rough it in with the measuring device and then eyeball the final trim. So what I'm doing right now is just marking a height relative to where it comes over the corner. 
but it's not terribly exacting measurement because they each have a slightly different lump. And then I'm gonna trim these away and then I will start to shape them. I snapped my better pair the other way. Yeah, shoot. Let's see if I find any snips that I like better. trick. So this pair is over there. They're not well aligned. Ugh. These are not doing the trick. Just I have to pack it up and use my too big pair. You could also saw these off again. I'm not sure I have a delicate enough touch to do so without injuring the stone. Oh shit, I did that one too low. Pardon my French. It's definitely time to replace my broken pair of delicate snips. These are too coarse for what, the, what I'm trying to do here. All right, now I've got some cleanup and shaping to do again using that isn't going to hurt the stone if it runs against it, ideally. File. Actually, I think I can possibly take the stone out of the way a little bit. So I'm just going to put a more traditional sort of uh, point on these. Now, just to off the off uh, topic, kind of, have you ever used half round uh, wire to make prongs? Absolutely. I love using half round wire, especially on things like the next setting that we're going to do where we're making a template, although it's a little harder to set up a template for, um, but a tube setting with half round prongs added is really wonderful, or mm -hmm. a step bezel with half round prongs added. Yeah, I love it. I also like using square or rectangular wire. I'm going to open these up again a little bit um, and just pull the stone out because I'm nervous about getting this stone. It's pretty fragile. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's so even um, heavy gauge pattern wire can make for interesting prongs. Don't limit yourself. Gang, I'm being really klutzy on this one. I'm just trying to give myself a little more leeway to not injure the stone. Should have done a little shaping earlier. Yeah, Rachel, that's what I was wondering. Because, you know, you have those cuppers. So I was, yeah. I was wondering at what point so do you I, use them? I would use the cuppers. 
after I've done my base filing, if I wanted a perfectly round top, I'm trying to do a hand filed one of the, I really like the, um, what do you call it tiger claw or something like that, the sort of point. Um, but you could absolutely just come in here with a cup burr and do that. If you want just a simple round, round edge. Oh my goodness, what am I doing today here? Let me peel this up a little bit more. Small one. Good thing I have two of these because this one's so sloppy, I'm going to have to do another one. Um, there we go. That's what I needed. Okay, so I'm going to try and shape these without the stone in place now that I have a better sense of height. And where's my big file? So I'm just going for a tapered point that looks consistent all the way around. But yes, absolutely, Carmen, you can you can finish all of them with round with cup burrs. It gives a very uh, blunted, specific look to it, which is a fairly traditional one that you'll see. I'm going for, I hope that's starting to show, more of a claw tip. So Rachel, how do you know, like when you should maybe um, anneal because I have been noticing maybe for myself with my prongs, I've broken yeah. them. I've broken them as though, you know, like hmm. you were going back and forth with the tension and you know how you have, ah. have that stress and. Yeah, um, got it. So that, that is a tough dance. I try to not anneal once I've gotten to this phase, because remember if they're annealed and they don't get work hardened as you're setting, um, enough, then they're going to easily pull up if somebody catches a prong on something. Um, so that's, I, I don't know that I ever, if I can, I don't know if I've ever remembered going in and annealing specifically to get a prong down. I do it a lot when it's uh, an outer bezel. Um, mm -hmm. Not saying you can't, just remember that the balance on that is that you risk making a prong too soft to really do its job. Mm -hmm. Are you snapping them or are you, are they pulling off? Well, it's like when I'm pushing them over, like I had um, one that I worked on this week and then I wanted to have the bezel and then I added the prong just yeah. on the inside just to make it extra. And two of them worked and one broke off. It's just like when I put it over the stone, you know, when so I- So another it. possibility is, did you cut in the prongs? Did you do that filing in? Yeah. So, so you may have filed too far. Yeah. And frankly, if you're doing it as a prong outside of a step bezel, so that the walls of the step bezel are already getting pushed over, you don't need to do that cutting in for those kinds of prongs. You'd only need to do it if they are- abutting the stone directly yeah that's what it was is that I had a bezel and it was the corners were a tiny big so I'm like I think I'm just going to fill them with prongs yeah and it's soldered and all of that and I thought oh this, this maybe this will work out but then no it just I think from putting the stone in and out in and out yeah in and out I think maybe I just but it's happened to me three times already, so I don't know what I'm doing. 
Yeah, I mean, if it's not snapping the whole prong off, if it's snapping in half, then I think you may be onto something about how much you're bending it forward and back. Um, but without watching, you know, your process exactly, I can't be 100%. Um, I think if there's anything else that would concern me. The other thing is, you know, use it as a teaching exercise. Repronging is one of those techniques that's really, really hard to do. Generally, it's done with, you know, gold um, to make it a harder prong, but it is possible to extend a prong that has snapped off with hard solder. If you do a quick solder in to solder another piece on, the solder becomes the hardest point to bend. So it's a little tricky. Um, but if you still have that bezel, it might be worth just as a, again, don't throw anything away until you've tried corrections exercise. So hopefully you guys can see, I don't know if it's too small, but you can see I'm starting to get those pointed tipped ends, mm -hmm. trying to give a little bit of shape to it. Yeah. I really like the claw look. I think it sort of delicately grasps instead yeah, of- Yeah, me too, me too. Yeah. Like um, much easier to do without the stone sitting there in the way. <laughs> And I'm worried that I've actually trimmed this piece a little too small. What is it just bent over? Let's see, I think this one may be the short one that's gonna dry. You know, Rachel, I was reading something the big shots from jewelry have said about the 2023 look. Of yeah, jewelry. what's the look? Um, and they seem to say that they want things to be a little more, um, uh, you know, like what you just said, like the, 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 the claw look a little more, I can't find the word uh, to say, but more not out there, not gothic, gothic, but in between, you know, like, oh. I am, you know what I mean? Okay. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so maybe it's edgy. Uh, edgy. Yeah. There she oh, is. Nice. Yeah. All right. Now, I've never particularly been known as edgy, but uh, I'll see what I can do for this season. <laughs> yes, that's a good idea. It's a new look for you. It's a totally new look. I may have to get my nose pierced. Uh-oh. Oh, that's, 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 that's a two, two, uh, whole new range of jewelry for you. Yep. <laughs> I think the edgiest I get are my woven uh, choke collars. Those get those get attention from folks who tend to dress a little more out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got one prong that's just going to drive all the others to be shorter because I trimmed it too close. So I love snips, but the ones that have, Zerons that have the extra support piece, they just are too hard to control up close. And I just the other day snapped off the point of my poor little best trim scissor, trim snips. So again, we're watching the exciting adventures of Rachel Filing. Any other questions out there about any of our process today? or any of our past settings. Hold on, I'm just finding that the more delicate it is, the harder it becomes. Yep. And that does not ease as you age, <laughs> gets worse. That's what I'm finding is I'm having a lot of fumble fingered stuff on the stuff that used to be manageable for me small. I need to work bigger. All right, so I've got these roughed in. If I hadn't trimmed one side too short, I'd be happier with it, but we'll see how it looks with these. Now they're not well trimmed on one corner. Get that a little point here.
a little bit more consistent at least. Now let's see if I can tuck it back in. There we go. All right. So now that I've got my shaping done, I'm going to go into a more complete push over in and over. So I'll do a, a stage at a time. A little short prong. Oops, tipping up. Yeah, this is too big a setting for this stone, but not by much, just enough to make it irritating. Now, in a case like that, couldn't you just like solder a back plate to it and that just solve it? No, it's not that kind of, it's not that kind of too big. It's this frame is ever so slightly too wide, which means that my prongs sit out further than I want them sitting to properly hold this. Um, so there's a there's a space that's created by the half of the wire that the the prong is pushed into. I need to do a little hammer set with this. Um, so I'm just not pleased with where the prongs are actually landing relative to the edge of the stone. This is going to be a little tricky for you guys to see. I'm just encouraging the movement using a hammer gently, but still with the prong setting tool because I don't have the hand strength to get the angle I need. When you're hammer setting, you got to watch out that you're not Hitting so far that it gets into the stone. So I'm being very judicious with how far I push this. And I'm not as likely to do this kind of a hammer set with, say, an opal or a malachite. Well, it's holding. Um, I mean, it's very firmly set at this point, but I'm not terribly pleased with the positioning of a couple of the prongs. Let me bring it over to the uh, close-up cam. Oops, my close-up cam. No video available. Oh, I must have knocked the plug out. Hang on a sec. Bear with me a sec, gang. I have to reboot the close-up cam. Let's see if it comes back up. Maybe. Maybe I unplugged it and it ran out of battery. Oh, hey, I unplugged it. <laughs> Let's see what we get when we plug the camera back in. Yeah, it's thinking about it, whether it wants to come up or not. So meanwhile, maybe I have to show you on this one. So what I am seeing, oh God, it's so fuzzy on this camera. What I'm seeing is some of the prongs are very far away. Uh, it's not really showing you guys, is it? I don't know if you guys can see. Some of the prongs are very far away from the stone at the point where we filed. I would want them not fully abutting, but a little closer than they are. Again, this is this stone is in here solidly. Like I would have to unprong it to, to get it out, but I just don't care for 
it's it's really held only by the front tips of each prong and not by the solidity of the pro of the back upright prong itself. I want those a smidge closer to each edge than I want. So there is a setting. <laughs> it's not my favorite. I'm gonna I'm gonna be a I'm gonna do the, the the Goldilocks thing and try to find a happy medium for myself between the fully measured version and the fully undercut version because that's where I want it. I just don't, I'm not a fan of that ring of silver around the edge, um, both structurally and visually. And I would do a lot more cleanup on these. I would take in, I would do some sanding in on them and probably uh, use my favorite Swifty wheel on it to get them cleaned up nice and trim. And otherwise we have a setting. I'm excited to have done a setting with an emerald cut. Woohoo! Um, I'm not gonna, just because of the time, I'm not gonna get us into this other one. Uh, but again, what I did to, cor to do corrective action, and this one will be too small, but not by much, what I did was sand back half of each prong, turning it essentially into half round wire from the uh, wall line back. And then I, on top of that, did the, the same steps you saw me do with a round file and then a crossing file and a little touch up with a flat file, with a barrette file. So it, it still has the cut-ins that I drew on the board. They're just back further in the round. And therefore, when I push over, they're going to be much closer to the edges of the stone. In this case, they'll probably be too close and I run the risk of chipping the edge of my stone because they're so tight. So I need something just between those two. Yeah, but what is that? I mean, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, and, and me too. If I had the answer for you, I would tell you. Um, and that's why I'm continuing to play with this one. As I've, as I've mentioned, emerald cuts are the bane of my existence. Um, and so I what I'm finding is that, so on this one that I did, John style, um, I did it basically measuring, uh, oh, I have the other stone. I can show you how I measured it. So when I did my measurements from edge to edge or from corner to corner, I should say, when I did from corner to corner, as John describes, taking each measurement, so the full width of it, that's what got me to this. What I, what I, when I did what I was suggesting, I was measuring just under the belly of it. So what I think I need to do is measure corner to corner per John's and then come in half a millimeter, quarter of a millimeter and make something that isn't gonna be tucked all the way under. I'm sure there is a mathematical way to determine it because what's really the issue is we are putting our prongs halfway in to our 16 gauge wire, right? And what I want is for my stone to rest just in front of those yeah. rather than all the way up against or hanging off the uh, hanging on the inside. And so it's probably half the diameter of a round wire that you're using, whatever gauge you're using for your upright prongs, less a little bit. But it, I can't get more precise than that. If there's anybody out there that has better techniques for this particular stone and cut, please, please share. Because it's the only stone I've found this problem on where I, where I really need to do my measurements under cut. Oh, I, I mean, I, I just think you need to pat your back. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> All that soldering. Jeez. And you did too. Well, you know, I did way more than two, gang. The scrap pile is big on this one. <laughs> Can I um, ask? Yeah. What if you put the um, prongs on at a steeper angle so they were tuck out? Yeah. Like so, the bottom, but the bottom, the base of it, a little bit smaller so that. Yeah. So what I've found is I may at some point in my practice be good enough to do that. Um, and I can do it on other shapes without having any challenges. The combination of getting my corners to line up 
and my angle is doing me in. I've tried it. And, and again, I wouldn't do more than literally the interior, for, like the size of whatever your top frame is your next one down would fit just inside of it, not not like extra small. But even that amount, I, believe me, I've tried variations for the past two weeks yeah. to see if I could come up with anything. And it's one, one extra factor that you have to bring in that's too many for me until I've gotten my practice better with the, the straight uprights. Oh, um, easier said um, than done. Yeah, seriously. I, this, one, this one is rough. This one's rough. Um, I've been playing with, you know, I don't have the same trouble when I'm doing trillions. I don't have the same trouble when I'm doing uh, cushion cuts. This is the rough one. Um, and it's a part of it is that the stones that I've chosen all happen to have really teeny tiny corners. <laughs> so I dug out uh, one of the things that I have partway finished on my bench is a larger uh, uh, smoky quartz so with slightly bigger corners. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm going to be playing with this one for a while. You'll still see me working on these. Uh, <laughs> But I have other things I need to get done as well. So there's only so many days I can spend on it. Um, oh, let me get the other one out of the pickle so we can see where what it looks like cleaned up. And then we'll do a little show and tell and talk about our next steps. Oh, I'm not even going to have it. Maybe that one's not done yet. Are you using your pickle hut? Or yes. Or? Yeah. I, yeah. I tend to use um, sodium bisulfate hot. So oops, I've got to be on camera for you guys though. So there's a little bit of torque from the heat. Oops. I'm still not on the right camera. There we go. Um, I got a little bit of a warp on one of my sides. So I'm just going to use my pliers and sort of straighten stuff out. Oops. Now I'm making it worse, not better. And um, then I'm going to check my stone set on this, which I suspect is going to be a little snug. Well, maybe not. Could be wrong. No, it's going to be a little snug. So if it's just minutely snug and you've got a fairly narrow profile up top, you can encourage the what are going to be the prongs out a little bit. But otherwise, you're just going to file them a smidge. Yeah, I'm going to the file. These are a little too close. So close. And in a perfect world, this will be an almost snap fit going in. You can see that it partially fits, but I've got the angle. So I've got to take the tiniest little bit off of this. And I'm going to try and work consistently around, since I did such a nice job of making it equal, as I was building it, I want to keep that equality of all the shapes so it looks the same from each side. Now, I say that. I say that it should look the same from each side. But in truth, if, for example, we wanted to put extra decorative elements on a couple of the prongs, we could come in afterwards. Once we've made our perfectly matched framework, we could come in and do some additional detailing to sides. But when you're building the base frame, you want to keep working uh, all equal to everything else. Oops, oh, maybe. Come on. Oh my goodness, it's so close. I just don't want to risk snapping. Yeah, I need a little bit more angle. And this also would need a lot of cleanup. You know, you're still going to sand everything. You're going to clean up any solder blobs that come out. Um, you might want to take down, like I've got a little tiny lip, bit of lip between them in the center that I should probably try and clean out with a file or with a burr or something. Um, and we're going to actually, we'll set this next session. I just want to show you where we are before we get to the setting phase because I, I need to clean it up before we do that. Um, you know that lo that looks cute without the stone. I will hang. I know it's a neat concept, and there's got to be some great clasps and things like that that have some kind of cross piece setting like this. 
So this technique is not exclusive to stone setting. Oh, come on, baby, thick. No, it's almost there. Oh, I've got one side that's not a straight up cut. Don't get stuck though. Here we go. Oh. So remember that when you go to the faceted version of this, we've had to not just make it fit in flat, but we have to make it actually follow the form of the stone. Where are you getting stuck? Okay, so I've got plenty of room on these two, which means I need to file these other sides that I have not been hitting as hard. Oh my goodness, guys. <laughs> The devil is in the details. All right, so, boom. We have, uh, I'm probably still gonna need to take a little bit down at the bottom, but what we have is the, the stone resting there. And we're going to, if it's narrow enough, we can just push these prongs in a little bit to hold it in place when we go to set. If not, we're gonna slice carefully a segment that is narrow enough on each of the prongs. So what we would do is slice here, all the way around and make a little mini prong on each. And then what we're pushing forward is this material here on the inside, pushing it over, okay? So fun card cut settings. Next time when we meet, we will be making one of these weird little frames that we can do multiple prong slash tube combo settings in. This is, this is a little distorted right now because I've been flinging it around, but basically it's gonna create a series of slots for the prongs to go into. And we're gonna, um, we're gonna put a set of holes that are equally spaced. Again, you can do these with multiple prongs. You can do three, four, six. I'm gonna encourage you to start with four. Um, and we're going to make a template for each given tube size. Now, um, John does these as straight up plates. My dexterity, once again, made me want, made me fling it across the room with the number of times I had to do it to get a good positioning on all of these. So I actually ended up going, well, why can't I solder down the exact shape tube, size tubing I want into the center of it as a template? And then my wires will brush against that to help support it. So I'm going to show you that variation as opposed to the plain, just the template version of it. Uh, this is another one that requires precision. We need our two squares to be perfectly square and to match. So if you want to play along at home, you may want to um, cut a couple of squares out of some heavy brass for next time uh, and get them all nicely filed because we're going to make a little X cross hatch on them and lay out our our template and drill it and prep them. And then we will make batches at a time of the tube wire combos. 
That's the theory anyway. I've made a template. I've never actually bothered to get it to the step where I'm soldering all those practice pieces together. So anyone so I've have any questions? About, about the tube. Yep. Should I get a tube cutting jig or something? If, if you do not own a tube cutting jig, you may want one. If you are willing to spend some money, I would suggest, this is one I haven't even spent the money on yet because I can't bring myself to say I can give up my other one. Um, Jane Redman has a new model of tube cutting jig that, especially if you're a lefty gang, hers is multi-directional um, usage and it is, uh, it's it's different. That, so there's the traditional tube cutters which have a whole lot of frustrating limitations about how hard you can hold tube material yeah, I together. I like that one. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan, but it's the one that I've grown to yeah. know. Um, Jane's has like already built in 45 degrees and things like that. And it's pricey, but man, it's beautiful. And it's one of those tools that I covet when I next have a budget to just give myself something. Um, probably, I usually wait till I can see Jane and buy it from her directly, but um, uh, so yes, you probably will want that. It's not that you have to have it. It's just that you will get more consistent tubes, cu tubes cut, but you can also cut your tubes on a traditional, um, angle jig, angle bracket jig, you know, one of these, or you can make a little channel in your, um, bench pin. I think you've probably seen that on my bench pin right here. You file a channel and use that to support your tubing. It's not as clean and you gotta be more precise. The other thing is remember, I think I showed you guys, maybe I didn't, I think I showed, maybe I was in my bezels class, um, how you can cut off tubing. If you use short lengths of it, you can cut it off cleanly using your flex shaft. Yeah. Yeah, did I show that on one of the videos? Yeah, in the class. <laughs> it was in the bezels class. So I'll show, I'll maybe show that during yeah. the workshop just because it's not in John's book. He doesn't, he doesn't cut things off that way, but um, uh, yeah, just using your saw and a, a Fordham, a flex shaft. Um, it works for obviously not all sizes of tubing, but whatever sizes you can fit in your flex shaft. Um, other than that, let me check my notes for what else is next time. We're going to start the, we're going to do the multi jig setup and we may actually get to our square wire prong, or if I have, oh, and we'll do setting of this one that we just did today. Um, so the the jig is kind of a pain in the butt to set up and then it's just boom, 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 you're soldering. Once you, binding wire is a good thing if you have some good binding wire for that one. Um, I like the black iron binding wire, by the way, as opposed to the um, stainless steel looking one. Um, I find the, uh, bi the black binding wire doesn't stick as much. But so that's how do you my anneal it? Pardon? It's very hard. It's very hard to to maneuver it. Yeah. Can it be I annealed? Would, uh, it, I think it can, but I, remember that iron and steel anneal by um, oil quench usually. I think yeah, it no, is. No, it's not yeah. the same. It's not the same treatment. Um, however, what I will so if you're having a real hard time manipulating it, then you may have binding wire that's too thick. Your binding wire on any project you're using it for should be um, as thin or thinner than your finished gauge material. You don't want heavy binding wire because steel contracts faster than silver does and it will collapse the work if you've got it heavier mm -hmm. gauge. So I have multiple gauges. It's hard to find a lot of gauges, but shop around and look for multiple gauges if you don't already have it. Um, and I'll show you John's technique uh, for making what he calls a twist tie. Uh, it may actually be up on my YouTube because it was one of the very first videos I ever posted was making the twist ties for hollow forms. Um, and uh, it's super cool. Like I hated grinding wire before John showed me the magic that is making a, a twisty because I was collapsing things. I wasn't understanding why. Um, and it's it's the weight of the material and not leaving um, the zigzag in that I'll show you, or you can watch it in that video. Uh, the zigzag is like, you know how on bridges they make the little extension things so that as it heats and cools, they, they it contracts or expands. 
that's what we're making in a good zip tie out of binding wire so that it has room to move back and forth so it doesn't collapse on you, right? Um, and it's magical. I don't use it a lot because again, steel steals the heat, but when you need it, boy, do you need it. Like my box making class, it's all over that. Uh, we use it a lot for that. Um, what else for next time? Uh, if we, yeah, we're not going to get to the prepping the graver. Um, we will want to prep the graver. So how many of you have actually bought gravers and handles and are waiting to size them until we get to it? I got one, two, uh, three. Yeah. Okay. So I may flip flop and I may do, we may do our multi-jig thing and then graver handle setup so that we have it ready when we get to the next chapter, which is only a project or two away. Um, and then we'll come back and finish the square wire uh, quick prong set, which is really literally sawing down square wire and filing a hell of a lot. <laughs> it's, it's about as simple as possible. And it's also one of the hardest filing angles of anything I've tried in his book. Like, it's just, re I don't know what he's, magical tools he's using to get his prongs as neat as he does. Um, so I've got to play around with things like sanding tools and, and sanding uh, uh, discs and things like that to see if I can figure out ways to get into the crevices that, that, that's in that setting. Um, and then we'll start chapter five, which is the graver settings after that. So February will be gravers. Any questions or better still, any show and tell? Pretty please, anyone? Oh my goodness, I have, people. I don't, I, have a, I don't have a show and tell I can show you, but uh, back to your tube cutting. Yep. I took some classes in making jewelry with bullets and having to cut up bullets. Okay. And my friend Lena said, get a chop saw. There's a miniature chop saw at Harbor Freight. It's about $30. And honey, that cuts bullets and tubes like there's no tomorrow. So I started using it when I was cutting my little tubes. I, I have one of those and I have not had great success with it. Are there any um, blades that you've found are better than others? I just, I bought the ones that, I bought the ones that, yeah, that's it. I bought the ones at Harbor Freight that go with that. Okay. Um, then no, I, I, I do what, put the, I do, I do wax them. I mean, I do put bird life on them or wax on them. Are you talking about this one? The hack saw? The mini no, hack? No. Literally a chop saw. It's oh. like a radial arm saw. Well, it has it's two, two inch blades. Yeah. Oh. And I got, I even went so far as to try, figured it maybe was my blade. So I tried the ones that were, oh, this, I may have the wood cutting discs on it right now, but when I have the right blades on it, um, I bought the extra metal specific blades. But yeah, if I, that's, it's what I hoped would be a dream for me because I make so many hinge based things, but I have yet to get it under control. Um, so I'll have to try it again. Yet another tool that I need to play around with more in my copious free time. <laughs> No other show and tell? No, I All have right. a guest. I have a guest, so that's my excuse. Okay, <laughs> that's allowed. Holiday, that's you got allowed. something, Carmen? Yeah. You got, okay, yeah. Carmen has something. Yeah. More rings? She's yeah. just like just prolific here. <laughs> okay. All right, what do you got? Um, I just figure if you're going to spend this much time and energy and trying to do all this gem setting, it better be a ring then, you know? <laughs> so I'm in a series of, I'm going to make rings. Nice. So I basically went back to the trillion. Oh, and, cool. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. I'm going to make it full um, What's the stuff? It, I made it simple, like just a simple here. And then... Yep. Just add it. I, I don't know. I have a thing with little balls these days. I have to add little <laughs> balls. <laughs> what stone is it? Very nice. It's a trillion, but um, it's just, I think, a CC. I'm not sure. Is this one of the ones you got from your friend's sale that you bought yeah. in the back? All those bright colored yeah. ones? Right? Uh huh. Yeah, I have those and I want to finish. Nice using work. Them. Nice. Very nice. So going out to I parties had... all blinged up, wearing one on every finger, I hope. <laughs> 
She can wear What's sandals and wear yeah. some on her toes too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you have others or was that the one that you wanted to show? Um, I have another one, but it's a headache. Okay. It's been a headache. <laughs> Okay. It's taken, me, it's, like it's taken me like five days and I'm, I, I finished it, but I'm not happy with it. Five days for a project? Unheard of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Miss Lightning Queen. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's not like I haven't done anything. I always have yeah. things that are halfway. So this is halfway. Okay. Hang on a sec. I got to spotlight you. Ooh. Wow. Nice. Is that twist wire? Fused uh, argentium. Fused argentium, nice. I can't tell whether there's a texture to the wire or not. Um, no, that, this is no texture, but now I have to figure out which shapes uh. do I do because there are two rings in each uh, link. Mm -hmm. and one is shorter, one is smaller than the other. So. I have to figure out, do I want to make one in a pear shape or do uh -huh. I want to make it square? Or I mean, so that's, I'm stuck there. I can tell you my favorite shape on my chains is the triangles because they go every which way. And I would love to see it in that double hook, double loop chain. It'd be both, really interesting. Both, both in triangles. It will be both a in triangles. and a bigger yeah. one. Cool. I'll try it. Yeah, because what happens with the man, so what happens on a standard, like just single line chain is that they kind of poke every direction up, down, in, out, all kinds of things. But I have a feeling that doing the double linking would give them a little bit more control, but still have that sense of movement because the triangle, if they're equilateral triangles, they sort of slide around on their points and move a lot within the set, the set of connector connectors. Right. Um, and it's one of my best sellers on my plain chains because I the people who try. want plastic I mean, different, you know, you don't buy a you don't buy a triangle chain at TJ Maxx. <laughs> right. No, I, this is my first time doing this kind of uh, chain. Nice. Yeah. So I'm it's very nice. nice. Now you have to work on your clasp. No, I want to do this one, the one that you did today. Oh, the, uh, the bezel set today and add oh, some stones. Oh, you mean the clasp? How the clasp behind it? Yeah. That's always my, you know, I told you already. There's a whole class coming up in, what is it, May, I think it was? <laughs> okay, well, anytime, I'll take it. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, oh. anybody else showing off? No? Okay, gang. Um, feel free to use that uh, registration code if you decide you want to sign up for classes. And again, you are permitted to share that code. I'm going to post it up to the Facebook group. Um, and it's just good through the 31st and it only gets you the 15% off on my classes, not the ones that I'm doing for other schools and stuff. Um, so, so our, if, if your class is in May, you can buy it now is what you're saying for 15 Any of the, off. any of the, yeah. If you know you want to plan okay. that far ahead, I'm yes. giving you okay. guys the, the bonus. I don't do a lot of sales because my margins are pretty tight on the amount of time I spend on a class. Um, so this is my my once a year, I give a special discount code out. And I figured the folks that have stuck with me on this certainly deserve some bonus points for taking actual workshops. <laughs> okay. I thought it was only like for our January class. Okay. No, no, not for the January class. The, the code is only good if you buy your class now. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, I, you'll, you'll want to read my, my, uh, refund policy and so on. Cause it's, there's some time limits about if you decide to cancel, um, too close to the workshop and I'm counting on you for my minimum numbers, I don't give you your money back, but, um, okay. yeah, but if you, if you're a planner and you like to plan ahead, go for it. Um, I think that is it for today. Welcome to the new year. And thank you for sticking with me for a whole year so far. I think yes. we'll probably done be yeah. done sometime this summer at the rate we're going uh, towards late summer it's been maybe. A year? We've, it has been a year. This is the this is the the first of the second year. We we met the very first Saturday of 2022. Wow. Yeah. So this is our 22nd session. Is that right? 22nd session. Yeah. Yeah, because I took a couple weeks off for vacation and shows that I had. So all right, gang, video will go up as soon as I have it processed in a few days and see you next.
time? Two weeks? 19th, I think it is. 18th. 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 All right. All right. Thank Bye, you. guys. Bye. Bye-bye.